In the preface, we have these words from Dr. Craig. As I read the treatment of divine omniscience in the standard evangelical works of systematic theology, I am often amazed at their superficiality and lack of clear logical reasoning. I believe that today the Christians seeking after truth will probably learn more about the attributes and nature of God from works of Christian philosophers than from those of Christian theologians. Well, I would uh, put another category in there and, and I would say that Christian philosophers should first and foremost be looking to Christian exegetes for the foundation of anything that they will do or they will be led astray. So when you have the entire section uh, titled Denial of Human Freedom, when the primary individual dealt with is D.A. Carson, his divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Um, that's almost all that is cited in the, these few pages. Um, obviously, all of us who would identify ourselves as Reformed uh, believe that man acts according to the desires of his nature. We believe in creaturely freedom. But most importantly here, we believe that the realm in which man acts, the realm of time, is dependent upon all the truths we just saw from Scripture. Those truths condition and determine and provide the foundation of any discussion that we're going to have about man's capacities, interaction with God, God's interaction with time, has to have a biblical foundation. You don't start with your philosophy and then go find stuff in the Bible to try to fit in there. That's the, that is the difference from my perspective. The only way you can call your position truly biblical is if it flows from the consistent hermeneutical application of sound principles to the entirety of the canon of Scripture. Sola Scriptura, tota Scriptura, let it flow from the text consistently. That's the only way to fundamentally identify what you are saying as biblical. I know the term is used all the time, but so what I want to do is I just want to quickly run through this and make some comments uh, on this particular material. According to the second denial of the doctrine that God foreknows future free acts, God does foreknow all future events, including human choices and actions, but only because none of them are, and here's the key term, are genuinely free. Now, we have not only in interacting with Dr. Craig in the past, but many people, uh, when I dealt with uh, Norman Geisler's material, genuinely free. So there is a um, circular argument behind this. For a Christian would want to go free as defined by whom in what. And so I would say that if God says, I will judge you in this realm based upon these set of criteria, that's our standard as a Christian. So if God says, I will judge you for acting on the desires of your heart, and I will judge you based upon my revealed will. Then I cannot go beyond that. I cannot go behind that and say, well, that's not good enough because there's more to it than that because, well, you created all things and you made me the way I am and you, you, you made me as tall as I am and, and as strong as I am and you, you placed me at this time in history and, and, and God says, but I'm not judging you on the basis of any of that. And there are many people that just go, but that's not enough for me. I, I, God may in his scriptures have said that, but that's not enough for me. If it was enough for Jesus, it needs to be enough for us. We are his creatures. Jesus is our Lord. You follow him. That's the end of the discussion. Anyone who goes beyond that is just demonstrating they don't recognize that they are the creation of God. So when we talk about genuinely free, um, we would say creaturely free. 
there's being smuggled into this an idea of autonomy. And autonomy, and the question is, does the insertion of human autonomy end divine autonomy? Or will there be, and that's what this is somewhat about, a means of providing a way to limit God's autonomy, to make room for creaturely autonomy? That's the issue. Jewish religion had a strong sense of God's sovereignty, and there is a stream of texts running through Scripture which imply that literally everything that happens is ordained by God to happen. Yes, there are. And notice it says uh, a stream of texts running through Scripture. Well, I just have to ask, is there a stream of texts running through Scripture that prophesies the coming of Jesus? Answer, yes. Can we dismiss them? Answer, no. If they have been properly interpreted, if a consistent hermeneutic has been applied to them, then we see that in the New Testament. We see in the book of Acts, all the sermons going, taking us back, Moses, all the prophets, so on and so forth. So we have to take that seriously, right? So if these, this stream of text has been properly interpreted, then don't we have to accept what it says? And if we accept what it says, and then we see something over here that looks differently, don't we have to put both of them together rather than simply dismiss one or the other? Or bring something in from outside of Scripture to undo these? Or to modify them or reinterpret them? Is a stream of uh, text writing through Scripture which imply that literally everything that happens is ordained by God to happen. Hence, it might be said that he foreknows the future because he foreordains everything that will occur. Foreordains everything that will occur. The word here is decree. I don't know why so many do not want to use that term. It's a biblical term. There are some people who say, I've never seen anything about a decree in the Bible. Well, okay. Yes, God has a decree. While too numerous for us to list, yeah, that's true. The texts which led to this view have been collected by D.A. Carson under four main headings. God is the creator. This is absolutely key. Absolutely key. God is the creator. Ruler and possessor of all things. That includes human beings, by the way. God is the ultimate personal cause of all that happens. In other words, once again, he is accomplishing what? His decree. God elects his people, so soteriologically, there is specificity, no question about it. And God is the unacknowledged source of good fortune or success. Well, say 45 7, even judgment and evil. It's there, it's there. Carson concludes with such sweeping sovereignty at his disposal, Yahweh's predictions concerning what will take place in the future and his control over that future cannot always be decisively distinguished. What he decrees must come to pass. What he decrees must come to pass. Looking closely, now this is Dr. Craig, looking closely at the text cited by Carson, we find that his conclusion seems overdrawn. In the prediction to Abraham, there is no suggestion. Now listen, now I, this is one of the main reasons I wanted to look at this. I want you to think this through with me. In the prediction to Abraham, there is no suggestion that God would cause Israel to be in bondage 400 years, but only that he would bring her out. I want you to think about that. So, God promises to bring Abraham's descendants out of bondage from Egypt, but that doesn't mean that the bondage to Egypt is actually a part of his decree? How does that even work? How, how, do, you, how do you, but, but only that he would bring her out, but only should she end up in slavery in Egypt that he would bring her out? That might happen, might not happen. 
So would it be the same as saying, if space aliens from the future attack, I will deliver them? That kind of thing? Isn't it painfully obvious? I mean, the way in which the children of Israel were brought into Egypt was what? Joseph, his brothers, famine, coat of many colors. And what does God intended this to save many people alive today? God was sovereign in this matter. Joseph knew it. We need to know it. And if the reference to Abraham is in the same scriptures as the reference about Joseph, then that's taking all of scripture in a consistent fashion to recognize these things. Uh, similarly, in Genesis 25, there is no suggestion of foreordination in connection with Esau and Jacob, though it must be admitted, Paul in Romans 9, 10 to 13 seems to make such an interpretation. I I'm going to go with Paul. I, I think, yeah, I'm, yeah, I think we're going to go with Paul on that one. That's, uh, that's an important one. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Joshua 6, 26 and 1 Kings 16, 34 do not concern for knowledge at all, but a curse is their fulfillment. On the other hand, Genesis 41, 25 does seem, and at this point, seems to suggest that, uh, what God had given to Joseph was not so much foreknowledge as a revelation of what God intended to do. Similarly, Isaiah's predictions seem to disclose what God intended to do in judgment on Israel, what God intended to do. What was the argument in Isaiah? The false gods cannot tell you what's going to happen in the future. I can. The false gods cannot tell you what happened in the past and why it happened. I can. This is what separates God from the false gods. And so whether it's in judgment on Israel or judgment on other nations, it doesn't matter. God's knowledge of the future is exhaustive because he is accomplishing his what? His decree. His decree. In this case, God's foreknowledge would seem to be based on his irrevocable intention to do something. To do something. How about something like glorify himself by working all things according to the kind intention of his will? Can we use Ephesians 1? There are a lot of people that say we can't. I say we can. I say we have to. And his knowledge that he can bring about whatever he intends. He can bring about whatever he intends. Now, um, I don't know if Dr. Craig actually believes that because I'm not going to be investing time in it right now. But my understanding is that what God can accomplish is dependent upon middle knowledge. So in other words, the content of mental knowledge determines the possible worlds that God can actuate. Now, we have immediately, immediately left all biblical language behind as soon as we start talking about actuating worlds. Okay? But <laughs> there is not a prophet, there is not an apostle who ever said anything about actuating worlds. Not even close. That's correct. <laughs> so, uh, We've immediately left that realm, but that's what this book is about. And I could take you to the last, we've years ago went to some of the last chapters and read through and talked about what God's intentions, maximal salvation or maximal good. And, and the idea that there are some people in any world given middle knowledge would never be saved. So to do something and his knowledge that he can bring about whatever he intends, asterisks, if it is a possible world provided the contours of middle knowledge. That's absolutely vital. Absolutely vital. This presents only half the picture, however, for the conviction that human beings are free, moral, agents. Okay. What does that mean? What, what does, what does free mean right here? What, what, what do we do with Jesus? 
He who sins is a slave of sin. A slave, by definition, is not free. What do you do with Paul? Those who are according to the flesh cannot do what is pleasing to God. They cannot even submit themselves to the law of God. They can't do what's pleasing to God. Dead in sin. So what's a free moral agent? If we are looking at biblical revelation, what is a free moral agent? What is the context in which judgment takes place? For the conviction that human beings are free moral agents also permeates the Hebrew way of thinking. There is no hint of fatalism. And, you know, at one point earlier on, he had properly distinguished between fatalism and determinism. They're not the same thing, but then goes here and uses fatalism. Don't know why. Fatalism is a misrepresentation of any Christian understanding of the decree of God. It's, it, the decree of God is purposeful and personal. Fatalism is neither of those things. So I reject that as straw man argumentation. It's a, it's a form of straw man argumentation through the use of terminology. There is no hint of a fatalism which reduces humans to mere puppets. To mere puppets. Now, the incarnation of Christ fundamentally refutes this. And I heard a guy who I'll be talking about more in the future um, commenting about a response that I gave uh, related to this topic. And he said, I don't have no idea what Christmas has to do with anything. <laughs> and I wasn't talking about Christmas. I was talking about the fact that for Christians, it should be absolutely central, absolutely key to our understanding of this whole realm that we actually believe that the eternal God entered into human experience and hence he who eternally existed as the divine son in the presence of the father entered into time itself as the God man, not as a mere phantasm, as a ghost, as a, as a chimera, but actually entered into human flesh. And that means he experienced time as the God man. He did things in time as the God man. And so what is central here is what that means is what happens in time is important to God and it's real. Jesus wasn't a puppet. Jesus did not become a puppet. And if Jesus wasn't a puppet, then we're not either. And if we're just mere puppets, then Jesus was a mere puppet and there's no redemption. Christian theology is incarnational theology. We have to reckon with it in all things. And as such, to pretend that the decree of God turns men into mere puppets cannot be defensible in light of the incarnation of Christ. This realm is not a realm of puppets. At the same time, what Christ came to do was prophesied hundreds of years before. His betrayal by Judas prophesied hundreds of years before. There was an absolute certainty. Why? Because the decree, the decree of God that brings about creation itself determines all events in time. The one working all things. That's the description of the Christian God in Ephesians 1, 11. And I simply have to ask you, if you limit the range of tapanta energuntas at Ephesians 1.11, the one working all things. If you limit that, I have to ask you the question, from whence comes the limitation? Is that coming from the text of scripture? Or is that being placed onto the text of scripture from something back here that you consider to be more important or needed? That is an a vitally important question. And so we are not mere puppets. 
The belief in the decree of God does not make us puppets any more than it made Jesus a puppet. There are some issues I'll get into later on. I'll just point out that there are some serious questions to be asked about the application of the concept of middle knowledge to the incarnate one. Because he was the God man. And questions we have raised as to the source of the content of middle knowledge. We haven't gotten into defining that today. We will definitely in future discussions. But these are issues that we want to get to. It's part of thinking these things through. But here's my final comment. The only way to think these things through is to begin to begin with God's revelation to us. You can't get this from quote unquote natural revelation. Hence there is no quote unquote natural theology. This is divine revelation. And you don't get it from man's philosophy. You have to have a starting place in God's self revelation. These are the actions of the triune God. So we have to have his word to reveal to us the truth in these issues.